So uh, to start out today, what I want you to do is I want you to imagine this. You die, which shouldn't be hard for us because that's going to happen to all of us, but you die and you stand in front of God. And God says to you, why should I let you into heaven? I just want you to process that because truthfully, that's something that's going to happen to all of us. I know that may make us feel awkward. That may make us feel weird because those aren't things that we want to talk about. But I want to imagine, I want you to imagine that. So I want you to imagine that you are dead. You die and you stand in front of God. And he asks you, why should I let you into heaven? Maybe think of it like this. What is your religious resume? If you had to fill out a resume of the religious stuff that you've done, what is your religious resume? Uh, I want you to think about that and process that. Maybe some of you have been through some near-death experiences. Maybe some of you have been to the point where you thought you were going to die or, or you, you actually were pretty close to dying. That actually happened to me last weekend, kind, kind of, it kind of happened. There was a moment where I thought, man, I, I might die. Uh, some of you may have uh, known, but last Sunday I was at my high school football camp for our high school football team. We're at a place called Camp Carlinville. We stay there three nights. And we uh, have one practice each day, do a lot of fun stuff like swimming and playing basketball and stuff like that. And so Friday night, me and three coaches jump into our golf cart that we, that we rented, or me and two other coaches. And we couldn't figure out how to get the headlights on the front of the golf cart on. Uh, it actually was really easy. You just had to turn the key all the way instead of two notches over. You needed to go three. But we were driving around in the dark. We drive by about 15 football players or so. And uh, we look at them as we drive by. I slap one of them right in the chest and say, sup, fellas, as, as we're driving right by him. As I turn back to look in front of me, there is a giant rock in front of us. A giant rock like, like this big, about this wide. It's like one of those decorative rocks. And we're heading straight towards this on the golf cart. If you know anything about golf carts, they only got a clearance of about this high. And we're heading for a rock this high. So it isn't going to end well. So I yell, rock. And the coach in back yells, rock. But the driver doesn't see it. And so we slam right into that rock, and I go flying out of the golf cart, literally flying out of the golf cart. Uh, it was one of those moments where, like, things slowed down for me. It's not really like time is going slower. What's really happening in those moments is your brain is processing stuff super quickly, so it feels like everything around you is slowing down. But I'm flying through the air out of the golf cart thinking, oh, shoot. Maybe, maybe not, oh, shoot, but I was thinking something, and I was worried about that golf cart flipping over on me and landing on top of me. And as I'm doing that, there's a guy in the back seat of the golf cart who's slamming up against the back of the golf cart and hurts his knee pretty severely. And the guy driving is okay. Well, eventually, somehow, I don't know how, but the, the golf cart actually clears the rock and goes over the top of it instead of rolling over on top of me laying on the ground. And I get up. Now, was I really going to die? Uh, probably not. But in my head for a second, I was like, man, this could, this could end real real badly. And so for the rest of the camp, players kept walking by me and slapping me in the chest and saying, sup, fellas, and making fun of me the, the whole time, right? So that was for me. That was a moment where I thought, man, I, I might die. And the truth is, is I would have to stand in front of God, and I would have to go before him. So I want you just to imagine that and really think through that. What would your answer be if God, you were in front of God and he says, hey, why, why should I let you into heaven? The cool thing is that Paul the Apostle actually answers that question for us in the book of Philippians. So we're going to take a look at that today and see what his religious resume is. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 3. I really suggest if you don't have your Bibles and you have a phone, uh, you can pull that out and, and Google it. Or you can go on your Bible app if you got that. Uh, I would always suggest that, but especially because we're outside here and it's a little harder outside. Uh, to to uh, We don't have a screen for you to read the text off. So if you've got something to look it up... Uh, uh, say you could look it up, but we'll be in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It starts off by saying this. Finally, now let me stop there. Okay, finally, Paul the Apostle is like any other pastor. He's literally wrote, written two chapters. He has two chapters ahead of him, and he's acting like he's ending this letter already. He's like the pastor who won't land the plane, is just flying in circles and flying in circles. He starts by saying finally, but he's still going to write double the amount of content in front of him. But I just love that about him. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So he says, rejoice in the Lord. He's been saying that over and over in the book of Philippians. He says, I'm going to tell you something that I've already told you, but it's not a problem. You need to hear it again and again and again. The thing that he's about to tell us, that he's warning us he's about to tell us again of, is the gospel. 
And here's the crazy thing, is Paul is always reminding the church about the gospel. He is constantly reminding them over and over and over because it's something that we need to hear over and over and over. We often see the gospel as something that a non-Christian needs to get saved, which is true. But Paul sees the gospel not just for non-Christians, but for Christians as well. It's a reminder that we need to hear over and over and over. It's the thing that helps us grow in Jesus. Uh, so the other day, I had to go to this mock trial. I had to go sit through a mock trial for 10 and a half hours. I got paid 300 bucks, so it was worth it. But I had to go and sit basically in this focus group mock trial thing at the U of I. And this defense lawyer came up. I'm not really allowed to share what he said because the case is still going on and it has legal implications. But this defense lawyer came up and he said one thing 132 times. The exact thing that he said is, this guardrail only takes 30 seconds to a minute to put up. Within his hour span of talking, he said that 132 times. And two, three weeks later, I still remember that because he repeated it over and over and over. It was so much so that everyone who was participating in the mock trial remembered it. We would joke around and be like, hey, how long does it take to put a guardrail up? And everyone would yell, 30 seconds to a minute. We all remember that because we heard it over and over and over and over. And so uh, the reason he did that was so that we would remember that, right? And so what Paul said here, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you it again and again and again and again because it's the thing you need to know. I'm going to tell you the gospel over and over and over because it's the thing we need. We as followers of Jesus, that's what we need to hear. We need to be reminded of the gospel. We don't start with the gospel and go into deeper theological waters. The gospel is our thing. It's the thing that we hold on tight to, and it's the thing that we need to hear over and over and over. Because what happens if we don't is we drift away. We drift away from the gospel. We drift away from Jesus into our own morality. Yes. We drift away into some sort of sin. We drift away into some sort of addiction. If we're not anchored in the gospel and constantly reminding ourselves of it, we're going to drift away into things that may even look like the gospel and sound like the gospel. What really is is just our own self-righteousness and morality. And so what Paul is saying here is, hey, I got something for you, and I'm going to tell you again and again and again. And I'm going to tell you the same thing. I got something for you. I'm going to tell you to you again and again and again because it's the thing we need to hear. So he then goes on here in verses 2 and 3. After saying, hey, I'm about to tell you something, you're going to hear it over and over. He then says, look out for dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. So he starts out by saying, hey, uh, uh, I'm talking to the dogs. Now, the, the word dogs to a Hebrew, to a Jew was to describe anyone who was non-Jewish. So anyone who was a Gentile, anyone who was a Greek, anyone who was non-Jewish, they would be called a dog. It wasn't necessarily a derogatory word, it was a description. It could be used as a derogatory word, but it wasn't necessarily a derogatory word. So Paul here is flipping the script. He's saying those who are actually dogs are those who trust in themselves for their righteousness are those who trust in their own flesh, are those who say that Jesus plus something equals salvation. Those are the true dogs. The dogs are the people that think Jesus plus something equals, hey, this is how I get saved. And for them, it was circumcision. Jesus plus you have to be circumcised. That's the thing that, that saves you. Um, the truth is, is that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus is all we have. And if you're trusting in your own morality, if you're trusting in your own righteousness, you're totally missing the point of the gospel. You're totally missing the point of the message of Jesus. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything, all right? And then he goes on to this in verse 4. He says, though I myself has reasons for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I, I have more. So he says, if anyone thinks that they're righteous enough to get their way to heaven, if they think that they're righteous enough to be made right with God, I have more reason. What Paul's about to do is lay out his religious resume. This is the thing that we're talking about. I had literally have a bug that's feasting on me up here. <laughs> what he's about to lay out is his religious resume. What he would say to God if he was in front of God and uh, God says, hey, why, what have you done? Why should I let you into heaven? And so he lays it out here in verses 5 and 6. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he lists this out. And some of it's hard to process. That's okay. We'll get to it. But the first thing he says is, I was circumcised on the eighth day. 
You're saying you have to be circumcised to go to heaven? I was circumcised on the day that God commanded us to be circumcised. Not just that, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. There were 12 tribes in, in Israel, and he could track his lineage all the way back to this guy named Benjamin, which was one of the more holier and, and uh, tribes that were seen as, as right. Uh, as a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. So he says, I was literally a Pharisee. We often give Pharisees a bad rap. But they followed the law pretty well. They literally memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they didn't just memorize it. Like, they followed it almost to a T. They would literally tie 10% of everything they have. They would tie a, a band around their head with the Ten Commandments, like a little box on their head. Like, they were serious about following the law. He says, if you think you're righteous, I, I was more righteous. Not, not just that. Uh, I was a persecutor of the church. He loved God so much that he would stone Christians, that he would beat Christians, and he would imprison Christians. And not just this, this is, this is almost a crazy statement. But Paul says this, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. He says, open up the Old Testament. Try to find something on the surface level that I, that I sinned on. I followed the law of God as well as I could. So he literally lays out his religious resume. And then he says this in verse 7. But hear this, this is where the, the text flips. So, so key. He says, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. He says, whatever righteousness I have on my own side, whatever righteousness that I've done by my own good works, I count it as nothing. It's, it's unimportant. So at this point, and I think I figured this would happen, this kind of goes over a lot of our heads. And as I start to explain Paul's religious resume, what I see and what I knew would happen is a lot of heads start to drop and people start, stop to lose interest because it's hard to process. But if Paul was talking to us in the 21st century, here's what he would say. He said, I grew up in church. I was literally spit out on the altar. I had a 30-year Sunday school streak going on. I haven't missed church in over 40 years. I am really good to my neighbors. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm just a really nice person. Here's what Paul says. All of that is rubbish. All of that is worth nothing. That will not get me into heaven. That will not give me the righteousness that I need. He says all that is just, is just lost. It's just thrown away. It doesn't matter what our upbringing is. It doesn't matter what we think our morality is. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's right. It's almost like Paul is saying there's two groups here. There's me. or He's saying there's two groups. There's Jesus and there's everyone else. Jesus is the only one who's righteous. And it's his righteousness that we need. Then he goes on here in the beginning of verse 8 and says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He says, I count everything as lost. I want you to think about this. What is everything? It's your family. It's your job. It's your kingdom that you built up. All that is good and fine, but I count it as nothing compared to getting the fact to get to know Jesus. Here's what I love about Paul, is that Paul literally got to see Jesus. Paul literally, Jesus literally stepped into Paul's life and met him on a road and talked to him and radically changed his life, pulled him out the muck and the mire. And so Paul knows that Jesus is real, and he walks with Jesus every day, and he just loves Jesus so deeply. He sees Jesus as a real person he has a relationship with. It's like if we could process that, if we could understand it, if we could just know that Jesus is there, and he's real, and he's, we're in a real relationship with a real person, it would totally change everything in our life. It would change us. And Paul here is saying, I don't care whatever else I have, I count it as nothing because I get to know Jesus. And Jesus is greater than everything. And the second part of that verse, verse 8, he says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He said, I've suffered the loss of all things. He says, I've suffered the loss of my comfort, my personal desires, all that, I count that as loss. Just think about the life of Paul the Apostle. Imagine you are a 50-year-old man, because that's where we think Paul was. You've been beat multiple times. You've been shipwrecked three times. If I am shipwrecked one time, I'm never getting on a boat again. But it's happened to him three times in his life. Not just that, he's had 39 lashes, like literally ropes being lashed at him to the point to where he was unrecognizable, bloody. He would have to rehab to even be able to walk. It's one of those things where your body's never going to be the same. Think about all these physical losses that he's had and all the things he lost, his comfort and his, all his dreams. and all. He says, I count that all as rubbish. Actually, the Greek word here for rubbish is uh, dung. It's, he says, I count all this as a pile of dung. It's nothing compared to getting to know and walk with Jesus. And then he says this in verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And here's what Paul is getting to. He says, my righteousness is not from me. 
I need a righteousness from someone else. Even though I've been a really good Jew and a really good person, and I've loved, I've loved people, and I've done this, and I've done that, I need a righteousness that's not my own. I need a righteousness from Jesus. So there's a point for us as followers of Jesus, hopefully there's a point in your life where you see, man, I need a righteousness outside of my own. There's nothing I can do, and I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. I'm not just going to mentally believe. It's not just something I say with my mouth, but I'm actually going to trust Jesus with my life. Paul is saying when you trust Jesus, when you have faith, you get his righteousness. Here's what ha happens. Your sin is right here. Jesus was perfectly good and righteous on the cross. That sin that you have was transferred onto Jesus, and the righteousness that he has is now transferred to you. And you have a righteousness that is not your own. You have a righteousness that comes from Jesus. Paul says, even all the good things I've done, it's worth nothing uh, because I need faith in Jesus. That's the thing that saves me. And, and then he says this in verse 10. 10 and 11 as we wrap up the text. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in death. That by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. He says that I just want to know the power of his resurrection. That everything else, it doesn't matter. If I know Jesus and I have Jesus and Jesus is all I got, that's all that really matters to me. Uh, it's when we realize that, that we start to love our family like God has called us to love our family. And we start to work in a way that honors work. And we start to do things in a way that loves God and loves people. It's when we realize that, that when we realize who Jesus is, that we're willing to lay down our life for him. Let me end with one more illustration, and then we'll talk about it for a second. And it's an illustration that I've used before. I've probably used it a couple times, but I think it's so key in understanding the Christian life. A lot of us think the Christian life is this. We're taking a little walk, and we kind of stumble into a ditch that's next to us, and we fall down, and there's buddy Jesus there to pull us out of, out of that ditch. We say, thank you, Jesus, and we keep going. Um, that's not what the Christian life is. Like, like, okay, uh, yeah, we, we fall. But the truth is, is, here's really what the Christian life is like. You're standing at the top of the Grand Canyon. And Jesus is saying, don't jump, don't jump, don't jump. And you're like, I'm going to jump and see what happens. You jump off the side of the Grand Canyon. You're smacking your body all the way down. You break your elbow. You twist your ankle. You get penetrated in the chest by a rock. You're bleeding everywhere. You land on the ground like a pancake, and you're dead. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead. But Jesus comes down, he climbs down that, that canyon, he breathes life into you, he sculpts you back to be, and then he puts you over his shoulder and you climb back up, that. he climbs you back up that canyon. And Jesus says, hey, I just saved you, now, now don't do that again. And you listen to Jesus and you follow him, and then all of a sudden you get this urge inside of you saying, jump off the canyon, jump off the canyon. And guess what you do? You jump off the canyon. And the same thing happens, you break your elbow, you get penetrated by the rock, your ankle gets twisted, you land on the ground, pancake, smack. Then Jesus climbs back down, and he sculpts you back together, and he breathes life into you, and he throws you on his shoulder, and he climbs back up that, that cliff there, up that canyon, and he sets you up, and he says, don't jump off that again. I love you. Don't do that. That's bad for you. And guess what? You follow Jesus for a little bit, and you do the same thing. And, and each time, maybe you get a little better, you take a couple steps forward, but you still keep going back to that canyon, and you go back, and you go back, and it becomes less and less the more you follow Jesus, but you still go there, and guess what? Jesus still loves you, and he still sculpts you back together, and he still carries you back up that canyon. That's what the Christian life is. It's his righteousness, not our own. We get his love, not some sort of fake pseudo love that we get from the people around us in our culture. A true, unconditional love that's based on the righteousness of him, not on your own righteousness. Amen. Here's the truth. Maybe you're more type A and you love spreadsheets, and you've asked Dave Ramsey into your heart, and you only eat healthy food, and you're just really good at following the law. You need, a, your own, you need a righteousness that's not your own. And maybe you're not like that. Maybe spreadsheets freak you out, and you hate Dave Ramsey, and you eat whatever you want, and you don't follow any laws or follow any rules. You need a righteousness that's not your own. We all do, no matter what situation, no matter which side you lean to, Democrat, Republic, a super righteous person, very sinful person, we all need a righteousness that comes from someone else. So I, I want you to go back to the beginning and go back to where we started. The question that I had you ask, you stand in front of God and he says, hey, what is your religious resume? Why should I let you into heaven? Well, how we should respond is we should take our resume, rip it and throw it and say, there's nothing I can do. There, there's nothing I've done where I should be led into heaven. 
It's all about Jesus' righteousness and not my own. It's not about what I have done, but what Jesus has done through me. And I put my faith in him and I trust in him. And that's what gets me into relationship with you. Now, I really want you to think about what you thought at the beginning. Maybe you didn't answer the question. You ignored it. I'm guessing probably 30% or so probably did that. And, and hopefully a lot of us in here answered, there's nothing I can do. I have no resume that can get me into heaven. But maybe some of us in here answered, and we started laying off this list of things. Well, you know, I've, come, I've been coming to church quite a bit lately, and I'm really nice to my neighbors, and I'm really good to my kids, and I haven't cheated on my spouse. Maybe that's what we laid out there. It could be possible that I kind of decepted you and set you up for a question that, that maybe that's not how you would really respond, because I kind of laid it out that way. But it might be possible that you've been trusting in your own morality, and you've been trusting in your own goodness. You've been trusting in your own righteousness. Maybe to a point to where you even never knew Jesus, really knew Jesus. I'm not saying you didn't ask Jesus into your heart. I'm not saying that you didn't pray a prayer. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, that came from a place of not understanding what Jesus has done for you. Maybe it came from a place of emotion. And you've never really trusted Jesus with your life. Um, you've trusted in your own morality. Here's the beautiful thing. If that is you, Jesus is still standing at the top of that Grand Canyon yelling out to you saying, call for me, call for me. He'll come down and he'll, he'll sculpt you back together and he'll breathe life into you and he'll climb you back up and put you on top, top there. It could be possible that you're trusting in your own morality and you don't know Jesus. The beautiful news is all you got to do is cry out in faith. Cry out and trust in him and he's there and he loves you and he's there for you. If that is you and uh, you do have that moment, even if you've grown up your church in church your whole life, uh, I'd love to have a conversation with you after, after service. So please come see me. Uh, even if my kids are being crazy and hanging on to me and yelling at me and throwing magnets, please come and see me. I would love to love to talk to you about that, okay? So let me pray. We'll end with one last song as, as the worship team comes back up, and, uh, and then we'll go on from there. Let's pray. Hey, Chris, are you going to need this microphone? Okay. God, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your love. We thank you. We thank you that you love us no matter what's going on, no matter how many times we jump off that cliff, whether it's in our own self-righteousness or it's in our own sin and folly and foolishness. We thank you that you continue to call out to us and say, hey, come back, come back. And you come down and you, you shape us and you mold us and breathe life and carry us back up. We pray that we understand just deep down in our hearts that our righteousness is not from you. It's from Jesus and Jesus alone. We pray that we just really understand that and see that there's nothing we can do to earn your love and earn your grace and earn a relationship with you. We also pray that Jesus becomes a real person to all of us. Not just someone we come to church for on Sunday, but someone we're daily walking with. A real person that we can look at and say, everything else is nothing compared to him. We pray that that truth will just penetrate our hearts and change us so deeply, Lord, to where we become a community who just loves and serves and follows you everywhere we go. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for a relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.